you have volume? I don't need that. Thank you. You don't need volume. Okay. Good. The Wi Fi is even working. So if we need that, uh, have it. Okay, I'll watch this. You're all invited. Okay, great. All right, you're live on the screen. That's what we're looking for. It looks like we are good. Let me get a mic. Which one? Uh, Can I pick whichever. Right. Well, I'll do the I'll use the other, and then I'll you signal to me. Okay, you great. It. Thank you. So I'm here because we are live streaming you into another room. Okay. Oh, okay. There's and this is the microphone for that live stream. So I'll do my best. All right. So it, to, it, to stay here, I'm, this is another room right in the building here? Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah. And uh, as you can see, we are quite often have an overflow crowd. So we have 15, 20, 25 people. Okay. In so it's if. I'll do my best. If you can just, you know, this thing picks you up if you're here or over here. Okay. Testing, it testing, It doesn't pick testing. you up if you turn around and talk to the screen. Okay. And then we can get... Are you, are you chair of chemistry? Uh, uh, how at, at these? No. Yeah. I was going to say that.
I'm good. Oh, for this. This is the microphone for the oh, people in the other room. Well, I apologize. I we turned you off, I thought. Oh. I'm walking away. Okay. Okay. So I have to stand still. <clears throat> this presentation, I think, is really important. It illustrates how small the globe is and how important are our common issues. Uh, Peter has been committed in his life as a chemistry prof to making education really matter and not just the education in the classroom where he works but in the broader community and in fact in the world and he has done that through the International Chemistry Organization, I think it's called Pure and Allied Chemistry, that has an education subcommittee rec who recognized that it was a global issue to address chemical weapons and their prohibition. And it was his influence that created the International Year of Chemistry and his subsequent involvement in the Education Committee of the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. And that organization in 2013 was given the Nobel Prize for their efforts to control chemical weapons. And Dr. Mahaffey continues to be the educator and the advocate for making chemistry real and prohibition of dangerous chemicals a reality. Thank you, Peter. Peter from King's. six or seven years with the course that she teaches and uh, I wear the pin for her school along with the OPCW uh, pin. So Margaret has, uh, has been a mentor to me. Um, I heard Anne say that the door is now closed and, and that's a good thing because you might think looking at my title that chemical weapons has nothing to do with you 
And if you think that, it's too late. You're stuck. The door's closed. I'd like to, to talk to you today about the work that uh, I've been doing for uh, almost 15 years now with the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. And it's work that's directed really toward chemical weapons and the re-emergence of chemical weapons. But uh, more than that, it's directed toward the responsible use of science. And uh, it's, it's some stories I'm going to tell you. And one of the stories is the story of this very small uh, university in Edmonton, uh, the King's University, and uh, the work that we've done with, with OPCW in The Hague. And I'd like to acknowledge right at the start that Jonathan Foreman, a, a remarkable science policy advisor for OPCW, I've worked with closely for about five years, and I sat down with him last month in San Francisco at a national chemistry conference and uh, told him that I was going to be coming and uh, talking to you about OPCW and its work. And uh, Jonathan was exceptionally helpful in thinking about uh, what kind of stories he would also really like to have told about OPCW. So uh, I'd like to acknowledge Jonathan's contributions to what I have to say today. But first I'm going to ask you to start by using your imagination. And all of you are attending Ella. Therefore, I know you have a great imagination. And so the purple background on the slide is intended to convey time to use your imagination. But um, I don't want to give anybody indigestion at this noon hour talk. I'm going to ask you to use your imagination to make some crystal meth. And think of this as a uh, breaking bad moment for Ella. So you are perhaps Walter White. It turns out that it's not hard to make crystal meth. If you're 19 years old and you have taken just a little bit of organic chemistry. And it's not hard to make because this serious drug of abuse crystal meth, methamphetamine, and here's the chemical structure, can be made in one transformation from an active ingredient in cough suppressants. And the active ingredient is pseudoephedrine. And you don't need to be an organic chemist to see that all you have to do really is to take one little functional group, a hydroxyl group, and remove it in one step, and you've turned the active ingredient in pseudoephedrine into crystal meth. And so this is something that's easy to do with organic chemistry, and it's something that is being done all around the world in basements, in clandestine labs, and so on. It's being done a lot right in Edmonton. Use your imagination now, if you would, and I want you to imagine not that you are seasoned professionals with a lifetime of experience, and a very well-tuned ethical judgment. But you are 19 years old, and that tuning of your ethical judgment still is to come, shaped by all sorts of things. You're a student of chemistry. That might be harder for you to imagine, but use your imagination. You're a bit short of money. That may not be so hard to imagine. And you've read about how easy it is to make crystal meth from pseudoephedrine. You've taken the course, you know about the lab, you have access to the materials. So I'd like you to turn to one or two people next to you and just engage for a minute with this question. Imagine that you're that 19-year-old student of chemistry, not yourselves. What might tempt you to try the same procedure? And in the other room, I hope you can do that too. I can't hear what you're doing. So have a wait. All right. Who has one idea? 
one idea that came up in your group of something that might tempt you to try the same procedure? Pardon? A dare. Money. Pardon? To make your own. Maybe you're a user. Okay. You watch TV. The daredevil recklessness of young women, you said. <laughs> All right. Here are a few more options. Suppose, I mean, why are you taking chemistry? You're curious. You want to know how the world works. And you've just read about this procedure, and you know the technology, and you have access to the materials. Might you consider trying to make it just out of curiosity, just once, just to see if it works? How many people think if you were 19, you might just do that once? Okay. Here's a question for you then. If you made it once, you're 19, would you tell anyone you succeeded? That raises a different set of questions, doesn't it? And it worked. And maybe you told your roommate, science is all about reproducibility. <laughs> maybe it was just an accident. You were lucky the first time round. Could you do it again? Could you improve the yield? How many of those of you who put your hand up are going to keep putting them up here? <laughs> are there any circumstances under which you might consider selling what you made? Can you think of a set of circumstances? You're dead broke. You want a car? There's a market for it. Pay the rent. Your mother's dying of cancer and can't afford. To. There are circumstances. Yes. You'll only sell it to friends. You have excellent imaginations. The little exercise you've just done is an example of taking an incredibly beneficial chemical substance. Pseudoephedrine is one of the compounds that can be extracted from the ephedra plant. And for over 5,000 years, the ephedra plant has been used in Chinese traditional medicine for all sorts of bronchial conditions. And it's used in modern medication as a cough suppressant. And what you've done, through choices that you've made as a 19-year-old science student, is you've transformed it into a substance of abuse, crystal meth. This is an example of the multiple uses of chemicals. So a chemical substance that's beneficial, has been beneficial for a long time, through choices that we make, gets turned into something that's very harmful. And this is a very significant story. The scale of the challenge of making crystal meth around the world is huge. The economic return is incredible, even if you're not a user. Here's a picture of discarded commercial decongestant boxes from the United States lining the ditches outside of Tijuana, where there was an industry making crystal meth, and the crystal meth is largely coming back across the U.S. border again. So this story is a story that's told in a set of web materials entitled Multiple Uses of Chemicals. And it's a set of web materials that has been created by a team of undergraduate students at the King's University working on a project along with the Professional Society for Chemistry, the International Union of Pure Applied Chemistry, and the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. Now you might be thinking at this point, what does this story of making crystal meth as a 19-year-old student have to do with events that you've been reading about in the news in, about a month ago in Syria? We have young children uh, killed, 
damaged her life as a result of a chemical weapons attack using the chemical weapon sarin. Well, the example of crystal meth is an example that we have chosen to use to get everybody thinking about the fact that sarin and its use in Syria is not just some remote problem happening in a place of the world where there are crazy people and it's a long ways away from my experience. But in fact, it's an example of the kinds of choices all of us have to make as scientists, as citizens, as politicians. And so a, a very dear friend and colleague, Alistair Hay, he's a toxicologist from the University of Leeds, who's been one of the people on the ground coming into places where chemical weapons have been used to try to do some of the scientific forensic detective work to determine what's been used. And I have run a series of workshops around the world for scientists and for educators, where we start with the very same questions that you started with today. It is, in fact, very conceivable that there are ways in which we might make choices to use beneficial substances for purposes that are very damaging or even deadly. And maybe the very worst example of those are the intentional synthesis of weapons of mass destruction used against civilians, chemical weapons. And following that workshop with scientists, we want our, the, the people that we work with as scientists and educators to understand that these choices are not always black and white. We live in a world of gray. And the choices that are made every day by scientists, by educators, by citizens, by you and I, are choices that can be a result, if they're bad choices, of errors. And these are usually non-intentional choices. And if you think about the scientific world, we can move along a continuum from non-intentional to intentional and from errors to criminal activity as we think about moving from simple wrong observations or wrong analyses, perhaps to undeclared conflicts of interest, to curiosity. Curiosity is not a bad thing, but curiosity can lead to misconduct. Can a su suspect chemical be made? Is there anything wrong with just trying it once? And then answering the question, would you tell anyone, is a really telling question. Because if in fact you've done something that you've said is just out of curiosity, but you're not comfortable telling your research supervisor, telling a family member, telling your mom, then you're probably moving toward misconduct. Would you make it again further along the continuum? Sell some. Now you're into criminal activity and large-scale manufacture. And it turns out that the kinds of choices made at an individual level with respect to the synthesis of a drug have lots and lots of parallels with the choices that nations have to make with respect to chemical weapons, many of which are made from benign beneficial substances. They're called multiple-use chemicals. And so the OPCW that has been the focus of this work on multiple uses of chemicals is located in The Hague, has a staff of about 450, an operating budget of about 75 million US dollars. And it's an organization, it's an international treaty-based organization. So it's not a part of the United Nations, but it was formed as a result of UN initiatives. And the OPCW has a mandate to in fact, make this treaty, the Chemical Weapons Convention, real. It was a relatively unknown organization until October 11, 2013. And Jonathan Foreman shared with me the tweet that appeared on October 11, 2013. All of the OPCW staff were consumed with events that were going on in Syria. 2013 with the use of sarin against civilians and nobody was monitoring their Twitter account and the Nobel Prize board was trying to reach OPCW and nobody was answering the phone and so this is at 11:44 on October 11 and at 11:59 another tweet you missed it guys the live webcast is over we're still trying to reach OPCW to inform them that you've received the Nobel Peace Prize. 
On October 11, I was at the University of Wisconsin in Madison giving lectures on chemistry and sustainability, and that's eight hours later than it was in the Netherlands. And I woke up to run through my talk, and I had 75 email messages from colleagues in Europe and other places in the world saying, did you hear the news? OPCW that we've all been working for in partnership has just won the Nobel Peace Prize. It was a real uh, surprise, and it was affirmation of the work that they've been doing. OPCW is now 20 years old. It has 192 countries around the world, states, parties. 68,000 tons of chemical weapons have been destroyed, and 890 years of inspector time since they started including 6,400 inspections around the world. What the Chemical Weapons Convention has been able to achieve in some years is banning an entire class of weapons of mass destruction. It's largely been a successful implementation of that convention. And yet we know that there are challenges to it as recently as last month in Syria. The Chemical Weapons Convention prohibits the development, production, acquisition, stockpiling, retention, usage, transfer, or military preparations for use of chemical weapons, or assisting, encouraging, or inducing anyone to engage in any forbidden activity. There have been other conventions. I'm going to show you a couple of them in just a few minutes. And uh, one of the big differences is that some of those early conventions, the Geneva uh, Convention, for instance, on chemical weapons, restricted, prohibited the usage of chemical weapons under some circumstances, but not their production or their acquisition or their stockpiling of them. It also prohibits the use of riot control agents, kind of a gray area for OPCW, when those are used as a method of warfare. So riot control agents are not prohibited if they're used to control riots, but they're prohibited for warfare. 192 states' parties now have signed on to the Chemical Weapons Convention and, in fact, make up the, the decision-making body of OPCW. There's only one country that has signed without ratification, and that's Israel, and three countries in the world have not yet signed for quite different reasons. And as you look at the list, you can imagine what some of those reasons might be. In the case of South Sudan, South Sudan was just because recently than the implementation of the Chemical Weapons Convention. I'd like to place what the Chemical Weapons Convention and the work of OPCW does in the context of other multi multilateral treaties and implementing bodies that have to do with weapons of mass destruction, because chemical weapons are not something that we think about as a threat in isolation from other threats. And the point of reference for the Chemical Weapons Convention is World War I. The point of reference for one of the other treaties that we're trying to implement is World War II. And prior to World War I, we have two, we have many declarations around the world, some going back several hundred years, trying to prevent the use of toxic chemicals as weapons of destruction. And uh, two of the most important of those treaties were the Hague Declarations in 1899 and the Geneva Protocol, which was in 1925. The Hague Declaration in 1899 banned projectiles with poison gases. And it passed with one negative vote, and that came from the United States, where a Navy commander uh, said, we can't support this because the inventiveness of Americans should not be restricted in the development of new weapons. The Geneva Protocol, 1925, so this is now how the world is trying to respond to the, to, to the horror of World War I. And the Geneva Protocol prohibited the use of poison gases, but not their development, production, or storage. And it had some reservations. The, one of the reservations was that you actually could use chemical weapons if you were a signatory to the Geneva Protocol, if the country you were using it on was not a signatory. 
And then we have World War II. War II with coming to an end with nuclear weapons being dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And that led to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty agreements over decades to try to get the key superpowers and then other countries involved in uh, trying to prevent the proliferation of nuclear weapons. 190 states parties in 1968, implemented by the International Atomic Energy uh, Agency. And currently, as recently as 1996 now, the formation of the Preparatory Commission for the CTBO, and the CTBO is the organization that is trying to ban the testing of nuclear weapons above ground, uh, underground, in the ocean, anywhere around the world. And we're not there yet. There are still eight countries that have not signed on to the uh, CTBO, but work is moving ahead on an ongoing annual basis to try to do that. We have the Biological Weapons Convention, which is a global convention designed to address the use of, of organisms, particularly microorganisms as chemical weapons. And some of the most toxic substances in, on our planet are actually created by microorganisms. It's, it's a very important convention, 178 states parties, widely acceded to around the world. But one of the big challenges with the Biological Weapons Convention is there is no verification regime. There's nothing like the OPCW that has the ongoing task of trying to ensure that those who have signed up to it are actually living up to their declarations. And then we have the Chemical Weapons Convention, which uh, the signing was in 1993. It entered into force in 1997. And in between those two years, we actually have um, a couple of incidents that were well known of the use of chemical weapons. Some of the major uh, platforms, goals, projects of the Chemical Weapons Convention, as carried out by OPCW, are to work on disarmament. So the destruction of massive stockpiles of chemical weapons, verifying that they've been destroyed, and about 94% of declared stockpiles have now been destroyed as of 2016. Dealing with non-proliferation, verification that in fact if you're signed on and committed to not using, creating, or storing chemical weapons, that you're actually doing that. And almost 8,000 inspector days last year alone were carried out, including many industrial inspections to try to deal with that important work of verification. To assist countries that are vulnerable in terms of threats that chemical weapons might be used against them with protection against chemical weapons. And then one of the very important areas is the area of international cooperation. And that's really the place where the education and outreach work that we've been involved with finds its home. Why do we need a chemical weapons convention? Well, there's a long history of the use of the properties, the toxic properties of chemicals in warfare it goes back to perhaps 400 BC. We have an archaeological dig in no, no, none, no other place than the country of Syria, where there's real evidence that there was an invasion by the Persians against the Romans. And the Persians succeeded by digging a mine. And in that mine, they put boiling bitumen on top of sulfur. And bitumen and sulfur react together to give sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide escaped, and all of the Roman soldiers that were amassed here ended up being killed. We have the siege of Groningen in the Netherlands in 1672, where Archbishop of Munster used poison nightshade in artillery shells to try to kill people through this very poisonous airborne substance. Uh, ultimately, Archbishop of Munster lost that battle. And then what we have what's been referred to as the Chemists' War, World War I, with 124,000 tons of chemical weapons used, 1.3 million casualties, and somewhere between 5 and 10% of those casualties being civilians. And this, I think, this war and the response by the world to the 
use of chemical weapons in this war is really the motivating force for the Geneva Protocol and eventually for the Chemical Weapons Convention. And uh, two years ago, right at about this time in our work at OPCW, we commemorated the centenary of the first wide-scale use of chemical weapons in warfare, which was in fact at Ypres in, uh, in Belgium in April of 1915. After World War I, we continue to see chemical weapons being used <coughs> in Russia, in Morocco, have the Geneva Protocol coming on with some reservations that are allowed. We have massive implementation of chemical weapons in Ethiopia by Mussolini and the occupying uh, Italian army. And I have a, a personal connection to that story. I spent the first, it was really privileged to spend the first 12 years of my life growing up in Eritrea, right on the border with Ethiopia. And about every two or three weeks, I would climb that mountain called the Mountain of the Cross, and it had a giant cross erected on top of it because that was the place where after one of the massive chemical weapons attacks, the Italian, a little battalion of the, of the uh, Italian army uh, was surrounded by Ethiopians and they were driven up the mountain. And the Italian general, rather than surrender, jumped off the top of the mountain and a cross was erected in his, in his uh, memory. Manchuria. Vietnam War, the use of tear gas, Yemen being used perhaps again, the Iran-Iraq War, the Biological Weapons Convention comes into place along this timeline, and then negotiations for the Chemical Weapons Convention, which is entered into force in 1997. And one of the incidents that you will perhaps remember is in between the implementation of the Chemical Weapons Convention and the signing have a very uh, important incident that happened on a subway in Tokyo using sarin, which is probably the same substance, which is certainly the same substance that was used a month ago in Syria. It had relatively little effect, uh, not as intended, but several people died as a result of it. So open for signature in 1993, entering into force in 1997, and OPCW deals with different categories of chemical weapons, and, and now that the convention has been so successful in terms of getting signatories, one of the biggest challenges is what do we do with these stocks that are massed around the world? And one of the big challenges is, is the very old chemical weapons that were produced for the, for the First World War, before 1925 or earlier, and then have deteriorated, so they're very fragile was a huge threat to populations and they need to be treated as toxic waste for disposal and so this was one activity that occupied OPCW in 2016. And then we have chemical weapons that nobody wants to take responsibility for anymore. Perhaps there's been a regime change or a country simply doesn't want to own up to the fact that they have chemical weapons and this formed a very a, a large component of the work of OPCW. And then we have large numbers of C-dumped chemical weapons. An easy way to get rid of chemical weapons, if you don't want to go through the cost of properly incinerating them and destroying them, is to simply dump them into the ocean. There are at least 127 known dump sites. And OPCW, by its mandate, is not able to deal with these sites because they're not covered by the convention if they were dumped before 1985, unless they've been covered. And so this is something that a lot of attention is now going into as we understand so much more about the fragility of the environments. And then troubling after the events of 2013 and the awarding of the Nobel Peace Prize to OPCW, largely for the huge efforts they had taken in Syria. Again, Syria, about a month after OPCW received the Nobel Peace Prize, Syria signed on as a state's party for the Chemical Weapons Convention. We have ongoing stories since 2015 of, of and first-hand accounts from many physicians and health workers of the fact that chemical weapons are still being used right after Syria joined the uh, OPCW. Probably what happened initially was that substances like chlorine were substituted for sarin because the stockpiles of sarin had in fact been destroyed. 
So uh, permit me just a, a short little lecture in chemistry, if you would. You are all 19 years old and students of chemistry, remember? So what is a chemical weapon? And uh, the formal definition is actually quite interesting in the convention. It's a toxic chemical or its precursor. So sarin is a toxic chemical and the precursors that you can make it from are chemical weapons, except where they're intended for purposes that are covered by the Chemical Weapons Convention. I'll give you a couple of examples of that. Here is sarin used last month in Syria. And it's made from a precursor, which is an organophosphorus compound related very closely to some agricultural herbicides, to Roundup, for instance, it's a different compound, the same class of compounds. And the ingredient that's needed to make sarin along with this precursor is rubbing alcohol, isopropyl alcohol, a beneficial substance that can be misused to make sarin. The toxicity of selected chemical agents varies widely. So here are chemical weapons, and on the y-axis we have the, the lethal concentration to 50% of a population exposed to it. So if there's a very big number, it means it takes a lot of that substance to kill 50% of the population. It's not as toxic. Small numbers mean they're very, very deadly. And we have things like tear gas and chlorine, phosgene, sulfur mustards, and then we have the nerve gases, which are incredibly toxic. We blow this up and we scale here. And some of the very most toxic chemical weapons are not actually produced by human beings, but are produced by microorganisms. Rice. Here's one example, nitrogen mustard. Nitrogen mustard is what we refer to as an alkylating agent. It takes the strands of DNA and binds to some of the base pairs and blocks them from binding to each other. That's the way many carcinogens work. <coughs> it's also the way that chemotherapeutic agents work. And so here we have nitrogen mustards, which are substances used in small doses in the treatment substances and also substances that in different doses and for different purposes are, uh, are classified as chemical weapons. And then we have a whole spectrum of traditional chemical agents and uh, we're plotting two different types of toxicity here and so the very most toxic substances, the ones that it takes the least amount to cause damage are found down in this plot. These are the agents. Then we have the nitrogen mustard blood agents and blood agents. Not nearly as toxic, but still very, very capable of causing injury or death. How do these work? Well, the nerve agents end up blocking an enzyme in our bodies that's called acetylcholinesterase. An acetylcholinesterase is a naturally occurring enzyme that breaks down a substance called acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is a substance that triggers nerve impulses in our bodies. And so acetylcholine is essential. It's what's allowing me to talk and think and move my arm right now. And then acetylcholinesterase kicks in and, and breaks down acetylcholine at some point. If you lose the enzyme that breaks it down, we have massive amounts of acetylcholine and it overwhelms the central nervous system. And so what sarin and soman and nerve agents do is they block this enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. And so if you've looked at any of these awful pictures on the web of what happened to children in Syria, what's largely happening to them is that they are suffocating their lung. Uh, their lungs are no longer working properly. The nerves aren't controlling their breathing and so on. There are three schedules under the Chemical Weapons Convention. I won't go into details about this, but Schedule 1 are the substances that are essentially produced as chemical weapons. Schedule 2 are substances that uh, are used as chemical weapons, and they have some other uses as well, but those other uses aren't so sort of significant. And Schedule 3 are substances that are commonly found in everyday life for other purposes, but they can be diverted or used for chemical weapons. So when it comes to those Schedule II substances, 
Uh, a lot of the work of OPCW is going in after an incident with inspectors and then trying to find the fingerprint for some of these substances like sarin or the compounds that sarin breaks down into in the environment after exposed to heat and light and some moisture. Incredibly important work to verify that a chemical weapon has been used. And then we have these dual use chemicals and, and in the education work that we've done now we're uh, asking that these be called instead multi-use chemicals. They can be used for a whole variety of purposes, some of which are to kill people. We have, for instance, sulfur mustard used extensively in World War I. It's a Schedule I compound. That's the only reason we would make it. And it can be made from thiodiglycol, not only a harmless substance, but in the pen that you're taking notes with, thiodiglycol is an important dye in the clothing that you're wearing, thiodiglycol used as a fabric dye. So a beneficial substance, but put it together with another beneficial substance, and you have a chemical weapon. And you can see why we have choices to make as chemists in terms of the regulation and control of the flow of materials, for example. So one of the other scenarios we work with when we work with chemists is to ask the question, you have a successful chemical company and you make dyes for t-shirts. And then all of a sudden you get an order from a company that is ordering 10 times as much of this thiodiglycol as they've used before. And maybe it's a country in a sensitive place in the world. It's a huge contract. Do you ask questions? Or do you just ship out the material? Maybe you have a commission and you work on a commission. So whose responsibility are these kinds of things in terms of making choices? So thiodiglycol used as dyes. How many chemicals are known? You begin to get a sense of the scale of the challenge that faces OPCW if you realize that every 2.6 seconds around the world a new chemical substance is being either made or isolated from nature. And so since the Chemical Weapons Convention opened for signature, we have actually either created or found 175 million chemical substances. Now think about substances that we find in nature. Substances we find in nature are often produced by organisms to kill other organisms. They're defense mechanisms, right? So some of these substances are inherently toxic. And of those 175 million substances, 32,000 of them have chemical abstract registry numbers. They represent scheduled chemicals. What if a chemical isn't scheduled? Can it still be a chemical? is yes, there's a criterion called the general purpose criterion. A chemical may be a chemical weapon depending on its intended purpose, and maybe the very best example of that is that yellow-green gas chlorine, which most of you in the room have probably been exposed to in the last week. If you went swimming, chlorine is used to kill things in swimming pools. It's used to kill things in our water supply, bacteria. So it is intended to kill things. But those are beneficial uses in terms of public health, and chlorine can also be used to incapacitate, harm humans or animals intentionally. That's the story of World War I. That's also the story of some of the chemical weapons use in Syria currently. So unscheduled chemicals can be chemical weapons, and technologies can also be chemical weapons. Munitions and devices that are used to disperse chemical weapons are separately called chemical Are explosives chemical weapons? They kill people. But under the convention, no. So the Chemical Weapons Convention does not govern the use of explosives which kill people by the release of energy. Napalm, a chemical weapon, it produces fire. Herbicides, chemical weapon, kills plants. Okay. Some interesting questions are raised by the limitations of the chemical weapon convention. And it's important to realize that the harmful use of other chemicals that aren't chemical weapons still are covered under many other conventions, including international conventions. Some of the things that are occupying OPCW right now are some very careful scientific work along with, with IUPAC on uh, new ways of producing toxic chemicals using, for instance, genetically modified organisms to produce using bacteria and inserting genes for algae 
substances. Um, a substance which is not necessarily very harmful if you have a little bit of the powder can become harmful with a different formulation, technology formulation, where the bioavailability becomes much greater. Can banned activities be disguised? Imagination time. What does all of this have to do with me? Lots of ways you can answer that. Here's one of them. Working toward peace and prevention of the use of weapons of mass destruction. It's my responsibility. It's your responsibility. The responsible use of chemical substances is one of humanity's most important emerging storylines of the 21st century. And if you attended Margaret Ann's class on tipping points in nature, uh, you would have learned about uh, the planetary boundaries and the fact that some of the, the very large threats to our uh, sustaining life on, on this planet for human beings depends on the use that we of different chemical substances, carbon dioxide in terms of climate change, nitrogen oxides, and, and so on. And there are connections among all of these things. Everything is connected to everything, and responsibility is a thread that runs through all of this. So if you can't see yourself being responsible for chemical weapons, you certainly can see yourself being responsible for the production of carbon dioxide. And there's been some very important work that's been done recently on quantifying the impact of climate and an enormously complex story is what's going on in Syria. But one of the threads in that story is a story of that conflict in Syria being influenced in really significant ways by a drought-induced famine coming as a result of climate change. Canada has played an important role as a peace builder. We're an OPCW signatory play a role in addressing issues of the responsible use of science and preventing the emergence. So as OPCW moves from winning the Nobel Peace Prize from a large amount of success in getting countries to sign on and have verification, its priorities now have shifted toward preventing re-emergence. And this is an area now where the need for science literacy and policy making is enormous. And this is the area really where our group at the King's University has come in and is doing our work. So there's the work of international cooperation, there's the scientific work, and then the realization that if in the long term we're going to deal with the prevention of re-emergence of chemical weapons, we have to deal with people and young people and education. And so this had not in the past been a very large priority for OPCW, it's now become what I refer to as the third leg on a three-legged stool. So here's the connection now between the work of OPCW, their committee on uh, working group on education and outreach, multicolored sweater there, and the work back here in Edmonton of a group of undergraduates at the King's University of King's Center for Visualization and Science. And what that group has done is to create number of things for OPCW and IDTAC, but one of them is a set of web materials that are interactive that are widely being used around the world. The URL is multiple.kcbs.ca to raise awareness about multiple uses of chemicals. And these are materials that have portals for students and educators and policy makers. And uh, just very quickly run through a few things. We start by talking about multi-use chemicals in an interactive way responsible choices in chemistry, the convergence of chemistry and biology and codes of conduct. And in fact, the story we begin with is the one you began with today. So that the whole notion of paying attention to this doesn't depend on whether you think that chemical weapons are something that in fact impact on you. And so we have a series of case studies of substances that are beneficial that have been misused for chemical weapons. Hydrogen cyanide used in the manufacture of nylon. Also a special formulation of that gas chambers in World War II, thiodiglycol from ballpoint manic used to make mustard gas, organophosphates found in substances like Roundup being used to make sarin, and bacteria that produce a nerve agent called saxitoxin. We walk the students through responsible choices in chemistry and we're targeting 19 to 22 year olds particularly, although this is being used in a lot of university ethics classrooms too. 
And uh, we start by saying, well, okay, you know now you can convert pseudoephedrine into methamphetamine. Um, we have a friend who wants to do that. How would you react? And here are some choices you can make. I'd encourage my friend to do so, or I'll contact the authorities immediately and tell them of their actions. And then depending on the choice you make, the professor refuses to help. I encourage my friend to stop meddling. Your friend refuses to listen. You leave him alone, let him pay the price for his misdeeds. You hear he's actually produced crystal meth. What do you do now? He goes to a party. Somebody overdoses and dies. Is it your friend's fault? Do you have any responsibility in all of that? And through walking through responsible choices in chemistry, we try to help young people see that the way they use technologies that are accessible to them, in fact, are the same ways that the world needs to pay attention to chemical weapons. The most recent initiative following the Nobel Peace Prize is the, in fact, building on that initiative is the uh, bringing together about 40 uh, influential individuals around the world to formulate a new set of guidelines called the Hague Ethical Guidelines to uh, guide codes of conduct for the responsible use of chemistry around the world. It has been translated into all of the OPCW official languages. Convergence of chemistry and biology, if you're an inspector going into a country to try to see if chemical weapons are being made, one of the things you need to do now is you need to look at breweries. Because in a brewery, you can take microorganisms, bacteria, and you can insert the genes for the algae that produce saxotoxin, a dangerous herb agent. This can be done at least in principle. And finally, codes of conduct. And we try to do that again by going back to an example. Young people can relate to perhaps an example of cheating and sporting So what does all of this have to do with me? Well, all of us have choices to make as citizens, as well as scientists. And um, perhaps one of the things we need to think about as Canadians in 2017 is that uh, Canadian jobs are being preserved, probably 3,000 of them, by a choice that was made last year to sell somewhere between 11 and $15 billion worth of light armored vehicles to Saudi, which is playing a very important role Arab in the world, and yet some of these light armored vehicles, there's real evidence that they're now being used in Yemen, and perhaps being used against civilians, and Yemen is now the place on our planet that has perhaps the most substantial issue in terms of dealing with uh, famine and uh, mortality resulting from that. So let me end with a purple slide, a couple of purple slides. Working for peace requires science. It requires education. I hope I've been able to convince you of both of those. It also requires hope and imagination. So I'm going to end with just a little bit of a, of a personal story that goes back to that connection I told you about. Uh, I was really fortunate, I consider it a huge gift, to have uh, been able to grow up in a town of about 2,000 people on market day in Santa Fe. It's in Eritrea on the Red Sea, right across from Yemen, very close to the oil fields, so it's been in the Middle East, so it's been a target for many, many, many years of superpowers interested in controlling access to the region. And it's also been embroiled in war with Ethiopia for a long time. My family left in 1967. And I was able um, to arrange to come back in 1998 for the first time after 35 years of civil war. To, uh, to do a sabbatical leave project at the University of Osmara and help the university build capacity in the area of chemistry curriculum. And uh, about a month before our family was scheduled to travel, uh, Ethiopian planes dropped bombs on the uh, airport, the airfields in Osmara, which were about 200 meters away from the apartment complex that we had been staying in. And that led to two years of what can only be described as World War I type several hundred thousand people killed in trenches battling for the border between Eritrea and Ethiopia. When the war ended, immediately after the ceasefire was, was signed, I was able to be on one of the first planes there to try to support my colleagues in the university and in fact to pick up on a few aspects of this project that we had been working on. 
And uh, two years later, when I came back again, I was able for the first time to get back to this little village that I was born in, the village of Santa Fe. And it was an incredibly emotional experience for me. Santa Fe is a gorgeous country. Here I am standing next to the Welcome to Santa Fe sign. I went and saw the sign and stood next to it, and then my colleague, uh, Solomon, pointed out that I'm actually standing on the trench from the two years of the war. And on my first day in Asmara, three weeks after the ceasefire had been signed, I was taken in as a family member by an Eritrean expatriate chemist by the name of Solomon. He was my age. Uh, he lived in Sweden. He had come back to uh, spend the rest of his career in Eritrea to help uh, the university. And on that very first day, I had been advised that this was really not a very good time to Eritrea, the ceasefire had just been signed. I felt this compulsion to get back and to help the people who had been waiting for two years for this support. And Solomon said, we're going to go for lunch. We're going to go visit my mother. And so we walked across Asmara and visited Solomon's mother. And the first thing she did was to make coffee. In Eritrea, difficult problems are tackled in about a two-hour process that involves roasting, cleaning coffee beans, roasting them, taking time for each other, and talking about what needs to be talked about, and it's led by women. On the way to visit his mother, he stopped. And I took this picture of Solomon because he stopped and he sat on a shoe shining chair, and he had his shoes shined. And then he got off, and we started walking, and Solomon said, I can tell, even though you haven't said anything, that you're a little concerned about Eritrea and what's happening here, and maybe about your own safety. We're so grateful that you're here. So that's why I stopped and shined my shoes. I said, okay. And he said, you don't shine your shoes if you think there's going to be no tomorrow. And what Solomon didn't say, but I'm sure played equally in his comment was, always shine your shoes before you visit your mother. <laughs> the last word I'm going to give to a very famous chemist who was born 10 years before the First World War, who died just before the Chemical Weapons Convention was implemented. His name was Theodore Seuss Keisel. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not the Lawrence. I need to simply thank this uh, group of undergraduates who've created the materials I showed you, and my co-director of the Visualization Center, Brian Martin, and the astrophysicist Ed Gaines. Um, our Visualization Center has about uh, almost a half a million visitors, unique visitors from around the world, accessing materials like this, but other materials physics, climate science. And uh, the people who worked on multiple uses of chemistry, uh, so this was in 2013, Joseph is now in law school at UBC. Uh, Theo is a front-end developer in Edmonton for Anglais that creates MOOCs for the University of Alberta. Daryl is in medical school in Ottawa. Nathan is a game developer for uh, a local software company. Uh, Miriam is an environmental educator for the city of Edmonton. And uh, Kristen is an award-winning high school teacher in the Peace River. And full disclosure, Miriam is also my daughter. <laughs> but I'm incredibly proud of all of them and very grateful that undergraduate students in Edmonton can play a role in contributing to a project like this. So we've received funding from various sorts, and I want to thank you very much for your kindness.